Hi everyone, welcome to Landing, Art and Market's second annual conference. My name is Ian T and I'm Associate Editor at Art and Market. This is the fourth panel of Landing, where we try to answer the question, how do estates keep their artists' legacies alive? Estates play a crucial role in protecting an artist's vision and keeping their works in the public eye. This is a multifaceted job that includes preserving archives, facilitating discourse, and initiating exhibitions, among others. In this panel, we get first-hand accounts from family representatives managing artists' estates and see if there are best practices that can be instructed for legacy planning. Before we begin, I would like to thank everyone for spending the next 45 minutes with us. If you have a question to ask the panelists, you can type it out anytime in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to them at the end during the question and answer segment. Now, today I'm pleased to be speaking to visual artist Pio Abad, who's also the curator of the estate of his aunt, Pasita Abad. Hi, Pio. So I was muted. Hi. <laughs> and Alex Turnbull, co director of the Kim Lim Estate and William Turnbull Estate. Hi, Alex. Good morning. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, very good. Thank you. All right. To kick things off, um, I would like to ask if you could talk about how you became involved with managing your respective estates. Perhaps we can start with you, Alex. Your mom passed away um, in the mid, in the 90s, and that's some quite some time ago. Did you, were you involved uh, with managing her estate at that point of time, or was it something that happened later on? No, when, when she passed away, unfortunately, I mean, she has this slightly um, strange position where as a Singaporean who'd come here in the 50s, um, you know, to study art, because I think there wasn't really the infrastructure to do that in Singapore, even though she was very well respected and exhibited, you know, extensively in the UK and was actually one of the part, the first female in the 1977 Hayward Annual, which was the kind of who's who of the sort of male artists at the time. She was the first female artist to be included in that. And subsequently the following year, 78, they had an all female, show um but she you know after her death unfortunately she was kind of forgotten i think because she kind of fell between two stools it was she wasn't hadn't really been accepted as a british artist at that time i think the british art world hadn't quite made that sort of connection that, that a foreign national who was a british a british citizen could could be a sort of british artist and i think the in singapore at that time there was a slight perception that somehow she wasn't Singaporean because she left Singapore, you know, without sort of understanding that actually sometimes you become more fiercely aware of your racial and national identity when you're transposed somewhere else. So I think that, um, you know, she, she was kind of forgotten. So we actually, because my father's an artist as well, William Turnbull, um, and we actually sort of started with Bill's estate. Um, and then as sort of time unfolded and it became the right moment, we sort of started sort of bringing Kim's work back. I think there was a period, unfortunately, where the works were, and I'm sure Pierre would probably have it, sort of the similar experience, where the works were just really not valued. And so our job at that point was to kind of protect the work and, and, and wait for the appropriate moment to sort of start present, representing it and repositioning it again. Because I think the thing you find in some of these situations is if you're trying to do that at the wrong time or against the sort of current of what's going on, you can find yourself sort of falling flat a little bit. And then sometimes it's actually much harder then to do the same thing again afterwards. So I think one of the key things in this thing with the states is timing and sort of understanding the sort of landscape that you're in and when at which point do you have to kind of protect and curate and almost try and if works are sort of floating around to try and you know reacquire works perhaps if they're not in good condition you know recondition them and stuff and then protect the work till it's till it's the correct moment to be able to bring that out and you have the correct people to work with because I think that's the other thing as an estate you're a sort of solitary entity 
and you can make decisions about what you want to do, but whether you can actually do that is contingent on a whole lot of other factors, including the curators and the other people that you're working with. So Pio, you are a visual artist yourself and you became more involved in managing your aunt's estate about three years ago. When and uh, how did you get roped in? Um, yeah, so I, I came into the picture. So for my, my aunt passed away in 2004. And uh, from that period until 2017, it was actually my uncle, Jack Garrity, her husband, who was, you know, as, as Alex was saying, was doing the, the job of protecting and, and, um, and really kind of keeping the estate intact until you know that bright moment when you know when when there was interest and when there was a, a considerable network of support and and I really came in uh in the context of an exhibition so in uh 2017 we started working on my aunt's you know first exhibition in Southeast Asia in the Philippines um in 15 years at MCAD in Manila and I co-curated that exhibition with the director of the museum, Postalina Cruz. And really that was, that was the beginning of my, my involvement with, with, with her work. Um, I think a huge part of that obviously was as an artist that I needed to feel uh, fully formed to a certain extent before I took on someone else's uh, body of work. And, and you know, it's, it's a considerable body of work that she produced. Um, and yeah, I think, I think the, the kind of, I think as Alex mentioned, you know, there is, there has been a gap of interest, you know, for, for just nearly 20 years, I think. Um, there hasn't really been much opportunity to show her work, um, but um, I think finally now there is this moment where she, her work feels very contemporary, but also very prescient in a way, you know, she was dealing with issues of, of kind of transnational relationships um, before that was, you know, very much um, um, an issue in the art world. Um, and, and that's also why it took a while for her to be kind of placed really, because she was part of so many different art histories, so many different histories as, as someone who led such an itinerant life. Um, and, but slowly over the last three years, we've been able to kind of build an incredible network of support through curators, um, through other artists, um, through different institutions who've then been able to kind of create this, this discourse um, for her work to finally be seen. Um, and I'm glad that you brought up the show that you co-curated, Pio. And of course, um, I think 2020 has been quite a, a big year for both artists. So Pasita had her UK debut uh, exhibition in a way. Uh, she had a major show titled Life in the Margins at Spike Island. And of course, Kim Lim um, is uh, a, a really important focus presentation of her work opened at Tate Britain in 2020 as well. And I'm curious, Alex, what's the process like working with institutions on these sort of major exhibitions? Um, well, it depends. Actually, in this particular instance, working with Eleanor Cripper. Um, from Tate, it was uh, absolute joy. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, institutions are all different. Um, some are bigger than others. Some have a sort of single head director who can sort of have a vision and enact that. Other larger institutions have lots of different sort of parameters that have to be fulfilled. So, um, you know, every it's impossible to sort of go, oh, working with institutions is like this because really every institution is different. But I think the, you know, the interesting thing about working, you know, with the Tate is we have a good relationship with them through both of my parents historically, um, you know, particularly through, through my father. But I think that, you know, it is very nice to see, you know, there is this sort of gender reappraisal in the art world, uh, you know, that's going on and obviously look, you know, it, what is interesting is actually, my father said that in, in the post Second World War period that, that actually it was actually when he went to art school, first it was mostly women because it was considered a polite thing for a woman to do to kind of for, for after dinner conversation to be able to entertain the men talking about art because it wasn't considered a proper job being an artist. So for a guy in that period, 
you know, and that actually up until the 70s or 80s, you know, art was not considered, people sort of forget that in the sort of current, um, you know, area that we're in, that, that, that actually art was not <laughs> considered an acceptable, um, you know, profession for, for men or women. At, at that time and I think that um, you know one of the, the nice things about this is you know that my mother who worked you know all of her life in a very quiet uh, manner that, that's it's still, the way my parents it was so different from how art is now the sort of the self-promotion, self-aggrandizement, you know, in that period, they were very, it was very post-war. So it was kind of a very passionate, sincere pursuit, but it was, you know, it wasn't done really for external validation because there was no external validation other than your peers. So I think that seeing, you know, them having worked in this sort of very quiet way all of their lives, it's very nice now to see the work being presented as I feel it sort of possibly deserved to be, you know, during her lifetime. But, you know, I think a lot of good artists and it's the same with music and creativity. You know, you're, if you're ahead of your time, a lot of the time it takes people a while to catch up, you know, and I think that that is sort of probably what's happening with peers, you know, uh, you know, estate and with our estate, I think sometimes it, most good artists and most good creatives tend to be like on the front edge. And a lot of the time, the people that receive recognition are the people who are kind of three or four steps behind, who kind of follow through once that zeitgeist has sort of captured people. But I think a lot of the time, and this is very true, I think in art and in all creative endeavors with music and filmmaking, which are my sort of areas, is that a lot of the time, you know, if you create something very new, people are often very resistant to it because people don't like people actually like something that they're familiar with mm -hmm. and understand. And I think that, you know, particularly in Britain where we kind of have a resistance to, or historically have had a resistance to abstraction. But I think that, you know, seeing this, seeing, I mean, and it began, we had a show in 2015 with Madeleine Bresper at the New Arts Centre, but it was the, the beginning of the reintroduction with my mother and then the show with Emmy at STPI, which was very sort of, you know, I, I think important in its own way. And that I think a lot of the people from M Plus who we've become involved with and sort of came and saw the show. And actually it was amazing, the relatively low level of awareness of her in Asia. Mm -hmm. And how many people who were, you know, even Emmy, when I met Emmy, didn't really know about Kim Lin. And, um, and so that sort of evolved. And then we did the show with S2, which was really with Bianca Chu, which really is what, and Darren Leake, which I think is what really sort of helped set it off on the, where we find ourselves now. I'm glad that you brought up um, the collaboration that your, the Kim Lin estate has with Bianca Chu, because I think the 2017 and 2018 exhibitions that she organized at S2 Gallery in London really was in a way that uh, that major kind of tipping point where this the, the interest in her work grew quite exponentially, especially um, within the commercial setting as well. And the Pasita Abbott estate has also collaborated with Silverlands Gallery on a couple of occasions to present her work at International Art Fest. And I'm wondering, Pio, how does the estate decide on who to work with? Um, well, I think, oh. A lot of it really, you know, comes organically from, you know, the initial exhibition, say, at MCAD Manila and at Spike Island, for instance, really came organically from conversations I've had with curators as a practicing artist. And, you know, I think because of these relationships, I was able to, you know, to share my aunt's work and, and, and a, a lot of, a lot of uh, younger curators weren't really aware of her practice. So they were coming into it. Um, you know, with fresh eyes and and seeing it through you know through the lens of the present, um, and that and that kind of, I think the timing of, you know, of these relationships I've had with curators um, and these conversations alongside um, the kind of ev evolution of discourse surrounding ideas of craft, surrounding ideas of gender, surrounding ideas of, of uh, 
I guess multiple global histories uh, shaping shaping art really came together. Um, and so, you know, yeah, as you mentioned in 2020, we were lucky to open the show at Spike Island. Um, and we we managed to run for, I think, six weeks before uh, the world as we knew it ended. Um, and in terms of, you know, of ongoing uh, collaboration, say with Silverlands, um, these really came through long-term relationships I've had with, with certain gallerists, with certain curators, and, and sort of folding that into the conversation. Um, speaking about um, these different contexts that both artists have worked in, I, I'd like to bring up a question from the audience that, uh, um, so I have one from Kathleen Ditzig, and she asked, um, Kim Lim and Tasita are both being reclaimed in the Anglo-Saxon art history uh, as well as within the Singapore and regional canon. And she's wondering how do the estates view and navigate these different canons? Um, maybe Pio, you would like to start first? Um, yeah, I think I always think my, my role in the estate is to insist on Pasita's complexity. That, you know, because, because it's, it's now, it seems, you know, all, all, these, all these obstacles that prevented her from being seen um, now as the art, art world has changed now seem categories that she can be easily kind of placed into um, but I think you know as as I you know as I work with institutions and as I work to with with the estate in in creating exhibitions really the the, the, the challenge is to is to a to insist on, on these complex um, political and you know geographic relationships that shape her work and and b is to also kind of insist on on the encounter of the works, um, that they're 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 presented in a very specific way, and and you know that kind of that they're both generous in and and also, you know that I don't know I think it's 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 creating a space for them, in terms of you know, in terms of conversations, but also literally in terms of 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 the actual installation of the pieces. Alex, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it, 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 it's a very important, prescient conversation at the moment. And I mean, I think that, um, you know, it, it's great. I think as an estate, having two people want to claim you is, is great. It's better than having nobody <laughs> trying to claim you. And, and I think that in these situations, I mean, what, what's interesting with both my parents, but, but you know, in, in the sense that we're talking about Kim, is that even though she was Asian and she was a woman, she, she really wanted to be defined by her work, regardless of her race or gender. And I think that obviously race and gender have become sort of key issues at the moment. And there is a reason for that because there was a sort of disproportionality to the sort of access due to those things. But um, in the end, I think it is interesting that um, both my parents, wanted to be defined aside from that, even though that identity does come into it. I think that, um, you know, in terms of, it, it's very nice to see her being recognized in Singapore. I think, you know, that is her country of birth. I travel, I've been there every two years for my whole life. My, my connection with Singapore is still very, very strong. I think it's great to see the kind of growth in interest in art there, because, you know, when I grew up, <laughs> it wasn't really like that in Singapore, you know, and art again was um, not something that I think people really understood or, you know, on, on, on a kind of wider scale. And I think the same is very true in the UK, actually, till the nineties, actually. But I think, you know, there has been a bigger history, obviously, of the kind of museums and curation and exhibitions in the UK, whereas um, Singapore is, it's a more recent, you know, obviously with the, the, with the National Gallery and everything and the incredible kind of thing and the, the sort of development. But I think culture and art takes decades to mm. develop. So you can't just sort of go, we're going to open a museum and, and we're going to have culture here. You need to bring through generations of artists. And I think that's why, you know, these two artists are, are very important because they wouldn't have been looked at or really held up in the past because there was no reason to, because there was no real interest. But I think now 
people can look back and go, oh, wow, look, these guys were pioneers because they were doing it at a time when this wasn't popular. This wasn't, this was kind of against the grain of sort of societal sort of norms, as it were. So in a way they, you know, their, their significance is sort of enhanced now, retroactively, if, if you like. And I think that, um, you know, it's interesting that for my mother, I've met a lot of the, a lot of the curators that we work with, at, you know, at M Plus or Tate or, you know, the, the Guggenheim and the, the places that, you know, they're, they're a lot, mostly female curators. And I think what is very interesting is that how, you know, for Kim, uh, they sort of see a, a sort of spirit that is inspiring. It's like somebody who at age 17 left this very comfortable environment, you know, in Singapore to travel around the world. You know, there wasn't even color photography really then. So what you were getting into and going to see, you know, and that's another thing we forget what our visual libraries have become now because of digital you know, information, you know, we, we have, we have access to infinite digital li uh, visual libraries, but back then it was like black and white photography. So, so people didn't know what they were going to go and find. And so I think that idea of, you know, female emancipation and, uh, you know, following your things, you know, regardless of what your prescribed sort of role in life is supposed to be is sort of served as um, to be as, as a kind of an inspiration for people. So I think that, that in a way it's been very, very rewarding for us having that situation. And it, it's obviously helped with the, with the dialogue and the conversation. I think, you know, it's the same from my end. I think it, it is interesting hearing Alex speak about this, but you know, the, you know, Pasita's work kind of elicits so much generosity from people because, you know, materially it's so generous and it's epic in scale and, um, and it, the subject matter like travels so much that actually a lot of the kind of, you know, these, these, this game of kind of playing with, but also eluding categories, the work does itself because, you know, the, her practice kind of goes from representations of, of, of kind of tribal masks to underwater paintings to social realist work. So that kind of the complexity of subject matter and material actually, you know, does that work as well? Um, one question that we got from um, friends and supporters of AM uh, when we announced this panel discussion was that uh, they're wondering what sort of advice would you give to artists who are actively trying to plan for an estate? <laughs> Sorry, you're going to take that, Alex. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a big, it's a big one. You know, it's a big one. I said, like, we, we've been doing this for 16 years now, and it's a huge, I mean, as, as an artist, I would say, get your stuff in order <laughs> to make it easier for your kids. And I think probably now it's much easier with digital sort of imagery and stuff like that and, and being able to kind of shoot an archive as you go. So I, I would imagine that some of the challenges that probably both of us have faced, you know, would be slightly different because, you know, I think we found, you know, with it's black and white photography of stuff. So, so you're, mm. you're trying to go back and particularly if you're coming to it after somebody has passed away, you know, you're trying to kind of fit the pieces together. And even though we were there, you know, we were washing the stuff for pocket money when we were kids and our garden was just full of, you know, really big sculpture and stuff. And that was our job. So we had a very sort of different, you know, relationship with it. But I think that, um, you know, in terms of, you know, your, your estates, I think the, the more you can do as you go, then the less work there is for the people afters, I think different, unfortunately, just because it was a different time, materials were different, resources were different, the way people had to sort of act in order to make art was different and what they thought they were making and whether they it had value was different. Perfect example is the early wooden works of my mother's that are on show at the Tate. I don't think they were ever displayed during her life. We found them right at the end when we were clearing out their house, which took two years to do to get everything out we found them at the top in her sort of print room 
covered in some old sheets and I'm like wow look at these I think she'd probably thought oh these are my early works so um, I don't don't need to worry about you know they're, they're they're not important and suddenly people are seeing these works and they're like oh my god these are you know these are incredible and so I think that that um understanding of the scope of an artist you know because first of all you have to understand that, well there's two sides from the artist side what you'd want to do to prepare to make it easier for somebody to manage your legacy or, or or then if you are the family of an artist you know if they're alive then you know start getting involved and learning about it because that will facilitate the whole procedure but if they aren't then that that's a whole nother uh sort of situation where you're having to go back and then reconstruct you know the timeline of the person's work and, and try to really understand mm -hmm. i think that's one of the things that's really important is that you have a really proper understanding of what you're dealing with in order to be able to represent it properly and i think you know obviously as as an artist like, like i said i think it is much easier to keep sort of archiving and, and records of stuff like that now but but as a sort of family or as a state of the artist you know that is one of the challenges is sort of understanding what what you're actually dealing with and then there's a whole lot of stuff that sort of comes after that in how you you sort of manage you know th that aspect of it but i think that that is sort of one of the big you know like i said there's three situations that you've got an artist looking forwards at, at oh how am i going to maintain my legacy you've got a family working with a living older artist where they can try and glean information from them which will help them manage the state and then you have the third scenario where you have people coming to something after the person has already passed and so you don't have direct access to some of the information so you're having to in a way fill in some of the blanks and the more uh immersed in it you know the, the more efficiently and the more sort of accurately you can create that uh sort of narrative in their work because i think that's a very important thing for the world when they're looking at an artist is what is the particularly an art a great artist but whose work hasn't been you know seen people have to understand the arc and the evolution of of, of the person's work I think I'd like to jump in here. I'm sorry, Peter. I'd like to jump in here just to add a another layer to the question, um, mm -hmm. building upon what I've asked. And of course, um, Erica Tan uh, has a question for you, um, asking if, do you see what you do now as a form of collaboration? And secondly, was there enough information that's left behind that instructed you or how much interpretive space is there around the world? And how do you think about your role in presenting it? Sorry, that was to who? Uh, that, that's for you, Pio. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, in some ways, you know, I see it as an extension of my own practice because my own practice is heavily involved in, you know, this entwined uh, relationship between family, art, politics, and history. So I, I deal with a lot of inventories and archives in my own work. Um, and I think this, this aspect of my own practice has definitely shaped my approach. Um, to dealing with, you know, Pasita's narrative, dealing with Pasita's, um, you know, incredible body of work. She produced over 5,000 pieces in her life. So there's a lot of work to, uh, to kind of document and organize. Um, so there is that aspect of, of my own work as an artist kind of shaping um, my work with Pasita's um, estate. But, but, you know, but there is also, um, a, a curatorial aspect that is separate I think the like Alex was saying um you know this building this narrative um involves a lot of logistical aspects like one of the largest um uh job tasks we have at hand is actually re-documenting you know this entire body of work because you know we were dealing with uh slides and film and 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 what was interesting when we first showed um, her Trapuntos in Manila in 2017 was a lot of people had seen images of these works um, prior, 
but they never really got the sense of scale of the work. They never really got the sense of texture because what, what the kind of innovation that we introduced, you know, posthumously was to kind of hang these works um, from the ceiling, almost like objects that you can kind of um, walk around. So this, the sense of encounter, which I talked about before and how that shaped this kind of reappraisal of, of Pasita's legacy, I, I think has been, has been important. And, and obviously my, my own uh, experience in exhibition making and has, has certainly been very important in, in making these decisions. Um, I always wonder whether, um, because for my aunt, you know, she, for most of her life, her home really was the most radical place to display her works. You know, she would have, you know, these huge tapestries really like right next to each other, sometimes even overlapping. Uh, and then she'd have them displayed alongside her collection of, of textiles from Rajasthan, alongside kind of um, Aboriginal sculptures that she, she, she uh, collected uh, during various trips. So, so there is, uh, in some ways, in, in curating the work, I've kind of, I've, I've left more white space for, the, for, for, for interpretation, both formally and figuratively speaking. And, and um, you know, there, there is always a question that I have whether she, you know, she would, whether she, you know, how much white space she'd allow, but actually it is important to kind of create these spaces. So there are these different discourses, different interpretations that can come in. And um, of course, there are many different ways of keeping an artist's work in the public eye beyond an institutional context or even beyond an exhibitionary context. And at bringing in your own personal um, skill set and experience, Alex, you made a documentary on your father, which was shown on the BBC, and you're also currently working on one about Kim Lim. So could you tell us a little bit more about um, your work with producing documentaries and this kind of film format to tell um, yeah. their life and story? I think what's interesting is, I guess, with, with my parents, is that their, their real influence on us, um, you know, they've had a huge impact, uh, but it, 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 it's it, our manner of working, whether it was in music or creatively, has sort of echoed, even though we didn't follow them into art, the, the, the sort of creative uh, areas that we've worked in have been very sort of influenced by what we saw you know, working from them. I think in terms of, um, you know, keeping the work alive, I think um, it, it, it coincided perfectly with me. Um, I think how it actually happened uh, with, with the, the, the film with, with Bill was, we, there, there was a show on at the Devine Hall in 2006. Um, and I was in there with my friend and, and Nick Sorota was giving this speech and he was referencing Bill's mm -hmm. paintings and comparing him to Rothko and Newman. And I turned around to my friend who was a filmmaker as well. And I said, oh, we should, we should be filming this. And it was the beginning of this sort of process that we sort of embarked on. And it coincided with me, Bill had just sort of asked me to help him with this estate because he was in his mid eighties. And so was starting to sort of not be able to keep you know, the business side. And the, the, I think there was some stuff that wasn't really going on uh, at the time that he was unhappy with, with the people that he was working with. And so he asked me to get involved. And so actually it, it served a perfect dual purpose because I then embarked on this journey to learn about him. And the interesting thing about, I think artists from that generation is that they didn't really talk about what they did very different from now where everyone talks about like, there's a blog for what you have for breakfast. I think um, <laughs> at that time, you know, people, they did amazing things, but they didn't really talk because they were sort of where they were at now. They weren't sort of thinking about, oh, who I was hanging out with 30 years ago in Paris. So I think that um, for me, particularly with Bill, when I made the film, it was a process of, and it was very lucky that he was still alive. That was the, the difference between my two parents. Kim was sort of gone before we'd sort of even had an idea that we would get involved with this. Whereas Bill, you know, having him there and being able to talk to him and go back. So it really, I sort of inadvertently became the William Turnbull expert because I spent so five years and each person I interviewed would say, go and speak to this person, go and speak to that person. Some of them were people that I'd known growing up. Some of them were people that 
I didn't really know about because I'm not really involved in the art world. I was involved in the music world at that time. I mean, our music was, I don't know if anyone, our band 23 Skidoo was very not pop music. It was very avant-garde, very sort of, sort of progressive, sort of experimental music, which was, I realize now, very influenced by the sort of attitudes of, of our parents. But, um, you know, I think that actually having that experience with them, you know, enabled us to then go forwards and be able to protect and exhibit their work sensitively. And that was one of the really important things that we felt was that it would have been very easy, and because we'd sort of come from a more musical, digitally au fait generation, to try to sort of somehow, and it was at the beginning of sort of that, I guess, you know, 2005, to try to kind of do this sort of thing of trying to hype it. But we understood very early, and that's not how we are, that, that, that it had to be managed in a very, in a way that was commensurate with the work and them as people. And that was a very kind of quiet, low key approach. And so the way we've adopted, it's a very long game that we've played. Protect, you know, when, when, when you meet people and you're like, oh, that guy's cool, or this, that curator, that female curator's cool. And then you just slowly develop relations with people. It's nothing like, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to, because you can't do that. Those, those uh, as Peter said, those relationships are very organic and you can't often chase stuff curatorially. You have to wait, the interest has to be there. You can't just go to an institution and go, oh, I want to bequeath these 10 paintings because unless you have a receptive director or curator, you know, they're not, they're not interested. They're interested in what augments their collection. So the sort of evolution and management of all of that stuff is sort of very slow and organic and has to be sort of dealt with. So I think the film, sorry, I digress, but let me get back to that. The film enabled me to immerse myself in that, fill in the blanks that I didn't know, and then sort of moving forwards, efficiently manage the whole work, curate it, put it together, build a space with my brother, Johnny, who I, so I should have mentioned, who is my partner in all of this, um, and uh, actually learn to place the work and curate the work ourselves. So put works together that hadn't, may have been from the same period, but had never been displayed together. And suddenly when they're put together, you can see this, that's like, oh my God, of course, those works should always be, you know, they should be presented together. So I think that that was, um, a, a, a really interesting process and, and it helped me create something that was a document that may, could, could give people a great insight into the artist in the shortest possible space of time because really to learn all of that stuff and actually most of that wasn't even available anywhere because it was sort of personal recollections. So I think it enabled to sort of capture a very important not least of which was actually having the artist there on screen talking about their own work. Obviously with my mother's one, well, it's a different challenge, but having made the film and also having gone through all of the process, I'm sort of better prepared to do it now because I understand more about the whole, the whole thing, their, their work, their lives. Whereas when I made Beyond Time, that was at the beginning. So I was kind of learning about, but it sort of helped me learn about it and it also helped sort of reconnect a lot of the sort of traditional relationships that we had or my parents may have had we inherited we inherited their goodwill actually which was a really nice they had a lot of goodwill from people because they behaved very equally with people so we sort of once people realized we were cool we sort of inherited that and um perhaps one final question for the both of you um looking a little bit more on the aspect of managing an estate. And um, I'm wondering, of course, both of you have mentioned the, the sheer amount of work that's involved in what you do, be, be it archiving, putting together a documentary film, um, even just locating where all the pieces are. Pio, you mentioned that your aunt has works scattered all around the world. Um, and I'm wondering, 
are there um, sources of revenue for the estate to do these things? And um, are they sustainable? Um, I think, well, from my, from my part, I think just to, to kind of contextualize my work in the estate as well, like I'm very fortunate that actually I work with, with my uncle Jack um, and his wife, Christy, who, who, you know, who've done this incredible job of actually consoli consolidating the work. And, and, you know, for the longest time, Jack was actually the one um, writing so much about Pasita. So there's so much material that then I, I have the privilege of, of somehow shaping curatorially. Um, so I think this, this job and the enormity of this responsibility would be completely impossible without, you know, without their vision that, you know, I kind of, uh, I'm in conversation with. Um, in terms of, of revenue, I, I think that, you know, that, that comes part and parcel with, you know, obviously as alongside uh, these institutional shows, you know, there are, there is the art market that you, that you participate in. And, and yes, it, it is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it is sustainable and it actually, you know, it's, it's a network, right? It's an ecosystem. So the, the kind of commercial aspects of, of this job do feed into the kind of institutional conversations um, that then enable the work to be seen more and to be contextualized in, 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 a, in, a, in a different way. Um, and, you know, this, it, it's been kind of incredible. The irony that uh, Pasita's work in the last 18 months I think have traveled more than any single person I know um, is a testament maybe to that kind of even increasing um, interest, you know, in just in the last 18 months, there was the Berlin Biennial, which I didn't get to see. There was the Guangzhou Biennial, which I didn't get to see. <laughs> um, and and a, a show uh, with some of her Trapuntos has just opened at um, Haus der Kunst in Munich and, and we're working towards uh, a solo show at Jamil Art Center in Dubai. Um, so, so th there is a lot of work, but I think all this work would not be possible with, without, with, without as, you know, without goodwill, as Alex said, without the generosity of other partners, and without these, these, these relationships that have evolved over time. You know, from, you know, from my work with these partners as, as artists to, to collaborators in, in spreading Pasita's legacy. Alex, would you like to have a, a final comment? Yeah, I mean, I think thankfully it is. It is becoming more sustainable. I mean, it wasn't always the case. And I think that, you know, again, this is one of these sort of delicate balancing matches between money and commerce, which to be perfectly honest, in my experience, aren't necessarily good bedfellows. I mean, and certainly when, even when we were making music in the eighties and stuff, it was a very anti-commercial. The worst thing anyone could say to you was that you were a sellout or you were commercial. I think the world sort of changed a lot um, since then. And obviously money and the value of things and a lot of the time, you know, particularly in art, the sort of people, the quality of something is judged on its cost, which is sort of a flawed uh, formula. Just because something is expensive doesn't mean that it's good. I think a lot of the time that sort of become the, the sort of mantra for a lot of kind of commercial, more commercial stuff. But I think that, you know, it is, it is, look, you can't run it if you don't, if it doesn't sustain itself. I mean, unless you have sort of endless resources or stuff, which we certainly don't. And I think, you know, what's been satisfying for us is seeing from when we started to now the relative value of the work only because, not because it's money, but because it's like, oh, that is unfortunately your benchmark of how the world perceives and the art market perceives the, the two artists and their relative relative worth. So I think that, you know, you need to be able to, you know, storage, archiving, all of this stuff, it costs money. And I mean, with Johnny and myself, you know, we're very fortunate that there's two of us and we've sort of worked very closely on this we're very bad at delegating. So unfortunately, almost everything we've done, we've done ourselves down to scanning images for websites because that's just how we are. And I think, you know, people know this, it's a very personal thing. This. So you really, it's not just you're doing something for somebody for, it's like, this is like your family. So it, it's a very deep personal thing that you're, you're doing this for. So, 
you know, actually in the end, it, it, it's not really about money, but unfortunately a bit of it has to be about it because there are inevitably costs and to present something to keep work alive, to, to, to uh, sort of restore, you know, uh, archive, you know, there's so much back <laughs> behind the scenes stuff that you have to do that people just couldn't imagine that I think, you know, you do need those resources and that's why, for example, now working, we've actually started working with Bianca and she's been, Bianca Chu, and she's been an absolute godsend because having somebody else to sort of help with that load. And also because Johnny and I have to understand that our background isn't really the art world. So we're experts on William Turnbull and Kim Lim. But in terms of sort of the, the interfacing with the rest of the art world, it's not really our, so all we've done is sort of protect this. And, and, and thankfully it has become, you know, it has grown and we can see, you know, the benefit in, in the people that we're working with now. And I think just to add to that, you do keep on you keep on discovering new skill sets. I think when you run an estate, um, uh, at the moment I'm kind of discovering that I could be a book distributor. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> a new facet to this job, and and I think it's it is rewarding. Um, it's the it, it's a responsibility and a privilege to be able to you know to share work that you believe in and to to kind of share. And I think also it's it's sharing the person that you knew in a way that, uh, you know, that, that she, you know, people can understand her as an individual, but also people can place her in art history. And I think for me, that choreography is absolutely rewarding. And, 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 and it's something, you know, I, I, I treat with utmost privilege. And um, thank you so much to you both for sharing such personal stories in your own uh, personal experiences and um, unfortunately that's all the time we have for today and I'd like to thank everyone for spending the last 45 minutes with us and of course to you Alex and Pio for that wonderful engaging conversation. Um, to our audiences if you'd like to catch the other panels and landing that happened earlier today um, please visit artandmarket.net slash landing to catch up um, on recordings of the past three sessions and um, of course landing also continues the conversations from AM's annual publication titled check-in and the e-version is free for all to read on artandmarket.net slash check-in there's also a limited edition print run of check-in and we would greatly appreciate if you would consider purchasing a physical copy which would go towards programming at AM, such as the panel discussion you've attended today um, thank you everyone again and take care see you soon bye, bye. Thank you very much thank you. thanks a lot Ian See you soon, Pierre. Yeah, we'll catch up. <laughs> okay, bye.